So just check this out here, Colossians. Act wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the time. Your speech should always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. Now, this is a long, long, long time ago that this was spoken. But how does that apply to us today? How can we do these things? How can we season our, our language with salt, be gracious? How can we know how to answer people? And we're going to be learning today, it's how, you, how do you make the most of the time? How many of you guys have had a conversation this week with somebody other than, than your spouse? The rest of you are hermits. And that's okay. Hermits need Jesus too. But making the most of your time is you got to sit back and go, okay, I had lots of conversations with people I, I don't really know that well. Did I make the best of that time? It might have been one minute, five minutes, 30 seconds, but did I make the most of that time? Was I a blessing to that person? That's what we're going to be talking about today. But it starts with, it just starts purely with asking yourself, what kind of conversation am I having? And the first level of conversation is shared experience, surface level conversation. Knowing what kind of conversation you're in, please, please take notes. Shared experience, surface level conversation. Have you ever had that situation where you see a person across the way and you're like, what's up? And then it's awkward because you're still there with each other, and you meant it to be like, a, hey, what's going on? And then you kept walking, but then you end up running into that person again in the, in the you know, high V. You're like, hey, weird that you're here, that you're still shopping. Oh, you must be stalking me. I don't know. And you have those weird conversations, and it's, that's, just a, that's the beginning of the acknowledgement. And at this point, you have a choice. Do I acknowledge this person and engage them in a conversation, or do I go back to whatever it was you were doing? And I want to encourage you to engage in a conversation. Now, if you're a Christian, this is an expectation. People come to know Jesus through a relationship with you. It's an expectation. I'm not asking you to, to talk to the creepy person. You know, if you're, if you're a young woman and you see this creepy guy, you don't, believe me, I can just tell you right now, Jesus has not put it on your heart to step out in faith and follow this guy back to his van to give him the gospel. Okay? So don't worry about that. But what I'm saying is, if they're not creepy, like this young lady, if she texts you this picture, just run. But what do you, how do you start those conversations? And we start those very basic conversations with shared experience. Very basic shared experiences. And it sounds silly, but this is the compliment. Hey, I like your sweater. Hey, the weather, man. I mean, how many, we can all communicate with the weather. Are you tired of winter? I don't know how many times I've, I've started a conversation with, uh, if snow was a person, would you like to punch it in the face? Me too. And just having those conversations with people, everybody understands what you're saying because it's a common experience that you both can share. Sports and whatever also works. And it sounds silly, but these types of conversations are easy. The I understand you conversation are a great starting point for helping people in the process of seeing God's love. Because a relationship with you is how they come to grips with how loving our God is. Because your story is supposed to tell the story of God. And you don't have to be a brilliant conversationalist. Look at this here. When I came to you, brothers, announcing the testimony of God to you, I didn't come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. We're not, we don't have to come to every conversation thinking we need to be a Bible scholar. I'm not asking you guys to devote several years of your life going to seminary. I'm just saying have a normal conversation. Just have a friendly conversation with people. And if you have a friendly conversation, you will be a pleasant part of a person's day. Wouldn't it be nice to know that when a person leaves your presence that they smiled, maybe the first time in a long time? Here's an example. You ever stuck, oh, here. So here we got Packer fans. You can always tell a Packer fan. I'm just kidding. I'm a Packer fan too. Don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, kids, you know, the joy of parenting. We all can identify with that. The joy, oh, you have kids? Oh, they're always sweet, aren't they? Bow ties. Now, I'll tell you, if I saw this dude, I would, with, without a doubt, I'd walk up to dude and be like, I love how you're rocking what, everything you're doing right now. Let's talk and have a conversation. How about a mustache? 
my son actually has started several conversations with, with men that we've been just around. And if they have one of those curled mustaches where they've obviously spent a lot of time working on it, he'll walk up and shake the guy's hand and say, I love your mustache. Or let's say that you uh, watched the Iowa-Wisconsin game, my alma mater. I don't want to get real deep into it, but I graduated from UW-Madison. I mean, you know, and then you see a fellow Hawkeye, and ah, <laughs> uh, see, these conversations are great, and they're easy. There's no expectations. Neither of you expects to hold the conversation for very long, and neither of you are invested in each other's lives. Hey, the Hawkeye game, or hey, your mustache, or hey, your outfit, or hey, whatever. It doesn't matter. All of those things are very easy conversations to have because there's nothing invested. But here's the thing. Sometimes those surface-level conversations allow themselves to get a little bit deeper. So, for example, let's say you're stuck at the DMV. So this is Nina and I. <laughs> Nina's getting her license, and this is actually the DMV's picture from their website. And so Nina and I were on, I'm on my phone, if you can see my phone right there. I'm sitting there updating it. And we're just, we're just staring at the thing, smiling, waiting for it to take our photo randomly. It was a fun thing that we do. Don't judge us. But this couple here, this is actually a mom and her son who actually goes to City High. And after this picture was taken and we were done being goofy, we actually end up having a great conversation with that couple because, hey, we're sharing the experience. We're all bored out of our minds. But now we have to move on past that to the get-to-know-you conversation. The get-to-know-you conversation. This is not a familiar conversation. This is not the, oh, we all share an experience conversation. This is when you start to ask them about them. You start asking the person about their life, and you have to be sincere. You need to actually want to know about their kids or about their grandkids or about where they work. If you don't care about those things, don't ask, because they will immediately know you're lying or you don't care. We want you to be real. Thessalonians says this, For we never use flattering speech, as you know, or greedy motives. God is our witness. We didn't seek glory from people, either from you or from others. I'm not asking you to pretend. I'm not asking you to be fake. I'm not asking you to do any of this stuff. I want you to be real. So only ask those questions that you really are interested in. Hey, how long have you been a Packer fan? Hey, how long have you lived in Iowa City? Hey, whatever. These are easy, and this is how you learn how you should answer each person. It's getting to know you conversations that allow you to get into their lives, hear their story, and to just slowly but surely discern how I should answer them. And the key to this conversation is, first of all, learning about everybody's favorite topic. You know what everybody's favorite topic is? Themselves. Every one of you guys has a favorite topic, and it's you. You are genuinely, but the thing is, everybody wants you to know them in a real way. God made us that way. We want to be known in a real way. And you can ask, oh, hey, and everybody, if you start asking people questions, I have never, ever had a person in thousands of conversations I've had, I've never had somebody say, I don't want to talk about that. Or I don't want to tell you about where I grew up. I don't want to tell you where I went to school. I don't want to tell you how many siblings I had growing up. People are always very quick to be like, oh, absolutely. Oh, I had five kids growing up. Oh, where'd you grow up? Oh, I grew up in Wisconsin. Ugh, whatever. Here's an example. See, I don't care about that question, so obviously I but ugh. Here, so this gentleman right here, this guy and I, I saw him wearing a bow tie and rocking a suit. I saw him across the way, and I walked up, and I said, I just want you to know, I love, is that a real bow tie? He goes, darn right it is. I don't wear those clip-on things. And I said, praise God. That's awesome. And then pretty soon, him and I are thick as thieves, and the next day we're having lunch. And we had some great conversations, and at the end of this conference he and I were at, we got some photos together, and we were just hanging out. But those conversations started because he had a bow tie, and I'm just not man enough to wear one yet. And I'm jealous of him a little bit, and I actually so I said all that to him. I'm like, oh, I wish, that was, I, wish I was just masculine enough to not care if I wear a bow tie. And here's the thing, you have to ask the who, the what, the where, the why, the how, the when of our lives. Just asking those questions. And then you actually are, have to be interested in those conversations. This is great because you don't have to be an expert in anything to ask questions. I'm not asking you to be a Bible scholar or any of those things. All you have to do is just be willing to sit there and listen. So this is what's called the ear model. 
I talk about this very often. If you, you've, I guarantee that if you've been here for a couple of years, you've seen this slide. But it's explore, acknowledge, respond. Explore, acknowledge, respond. This is when you just ask a question and the person tells you more. You acknowledge that, you're, that you hear them speaking. Oh, they say, oh, I went to UW, or U of I. Oh, really? So you went to U of University of Iowa. When? That's an acknowledgement. And then you explore some more. What was your major? What was this? What was that? Did you like it? What'd you, what'd you, did you go on? Where do you work now? You explore, 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 explore. Then when they ask you a question, you finally respond. This is just being a good listener. This is just being a good listener, being a good friend. And each person, they, their favorite topic is themselves, and they want you to care about them. Every single person in this place wants to be cared about for who they are, not for what they can give you. How nice would it be? How many of, I mean, don't raise your hands, but just think about it. How great is it when somebody talks to you because they just want to talk to you, not because they're trying to get something from you? And then at this point is when you learn the person's name. You take the time to learn the person's name. Repeat their name. You explore. What's your name? Oh, my name is John. Really, John. Acknowledge their name. Respond back. Oh, my name is Josh. Then you have that conversation. Learn their name because learning a person's name, it moves the conversation away from we're strangers to we are now two people. And that's really in, just helps us to come together at a relational level. The opposite is true as well, as we learn. When people get too chummy with me, I like to call them by the wrong name to let them know I don't really care about them. That's a genius move. Thank you. You're welcome, Lester. His name is Ron. And he, the point is, is the opposite is true. If you get somebody's name wrong like 10 times, eventually they're going to realize you don't really care. And that might be the case. But what's your name is a big deal. We tell these kids when they're little, what's your name? When you take a foreign language, what's the first thing you learn how to say in Espanol? Como se llama? What como se llama? Me llamo es Josue. That was my name in Spanish class. Josue. Because the Josh is hard for the Spanish speakers. And this is where you start to get real. You get that you're not, you're no longer a plumber or a lawyer, or a student, or a, a pastor, or whatever, you're now a person. And at this point also is where most of us start to get uncomfortable. This is where the F-bombs start to get dropped. And this is where the politics start to come up. And I want you to understand, this is not a bad thing. If somebody is, I'm not saying that cussing is a good thing, but I'm just saying is that when a person is cussing or talking about politics or whatever, those kinds of things, that lets you know they're comfortable with you. That they're not worried about whatever preconceived notions they had two seconds ago. They now feel like they can be open with you. I want you to look past your initial, oh my gosh, they're using the F word. And go, wow, I really appreciate the fact that they are trusting me enough to have this conversation. This is where conversations can go off the rails as well because this is the next level. Ethical conversation. Ethical conversation. Once someone gets to know you, they often will complain to you because... Anger is the strongest emotion, and we want to move away from anger to something more positive. So what happens is, is people will most often start a conversation with anger because they don't know how to love, really. And this is where you're sitting in the, for example, I was sitting in line at the high V or something, and all of a sudden starts, somebody starts telling me, well, Trump, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going, I, I didn't even... I, I wasn't even talking to you, and now, you know, dropping F-bombs and politics and how angry they are. I'm like, do you know the guy? I don't even know him. I, I, but you're very, obviously, very invested in this person that you've never met. Uh, let's talk about that. But it's an anger. Anger is a stronger response. But we want to move away from anger and try to bring them into something more positive. But this is natural. This is how God built us. He built us to organically navigate from a common conversation to an ethical conversation. This is a deeper conversation. Religion and politics, those kinds of conversations are real conversations. This is because we naturally want community. If this person who's behind me in line says to me, Trump or whoever, whatever, I can't stand this person, and I say, yeah, me too, that all of a sudden, we're a community. We are together agreeing on something that's above us, that's bigger than us. I'm telling you, try to not 
go into that kind of thing because that's a negative emotion. But that's what they're looking for is they're looking for something bigger than themselves to be angry at or to be involved in. I want to feel like there's something bigger that I can apply my life to, the recent scandal or whatever. And this is not the time to debate. I'm not saying if the person behind you says politics, whatever, and you don't agree, this is not the time to go, well, just so you know, the economy is up. That's not the time for you to have that conversation. You haven't earned the right to have that conversation. You are not going to change this person's political views in a, uh, in a line at high V. You haven't earned that. You don't, you don't know who they are, and they don't care who you are, really. This is, the con- this is not where that conversation is. You don't start a debate. But this, if that does happen, that's when you just go, okay, let's get back to exploring again. Oh, well, anyway, uh, so where'd you go to school? You, di- you just digress and go back to something a little more pleasant. But because these conversations can turn antagonistic very quickly. So what does the Bible say? Here's Grumpy. He, so Paul, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God in the marketplace every day. So he reasoned. Paul reasoned. He went to synagogues and he, he had conversations with people. It doesn't say that he signed up for a protest or held a sign or argued or called people sinners or called people gay or called people whatever it is that you're upset about. At no point in scripture do we ever see that kind of outreach. It's always conversations, showing love, gracious, seasoned with salt. We're supposed to be giving people the love of Christ. Having reasonable conversations. It doesn't say provoke them. In fact, it says accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. I'm not saying that those things that you hold so dear, your politics or whatever, I'm not saying they're not important. But here's the thing, your goal in life is to help introduce people to Christ, not to your political view. Praise God, maybe if they become a believer, they'll end up believing your political view, but that's not your responsibility. You are not here to be an evangelist for the Republican Party or whatever party you belong to. You are here to be an evangelist for Christ. Your whole purpose in life is to show people the love of Christ. And if your politics are making you angry, you might want to rethink your values. So we are called to love our enemies. Let's watch what Jesus does here when he talks to the woman at the well. You'll see the conversation go from a shared experience to ethical concerns. A Samaritan woman came to draw some water. Give him a drink of water. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. So how can you ask me for a drink? Jews will not use the same cups and bowls that Samaritans use. If you only knew what God gives. And who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would ask him. So here, do you guys hear this? It's very subtle. But if you're looking at, if you look at John 4, if you look at those stories about the Samaritan woman, you'll hear Jesus just ask, can I get some water? Or she's at the well, is it, can you give me a glass of water? And she immediately, so there's, there, there may very well have been more conversation that, the, that uh, John doesn't record, because the different Gospels have different length of story for this. But it, it may very well have been more conversation than what we have. But regardless, he says, hey, let's have a glass of water. And what does she say? She immediately calls him out on an ethical issue. She moves right past shared experience of water, drinking, we both are thirsty, to an ethical thing. How is it that you are asking me for water? Isn't it wrong for you to ask me, a Samaritan, for water? Because the Jews at the time wouldn't even share a space with a Samaritan, let alone a cup. For a Jewish person, can you turn these down? All I hear is feedback. If a Jewish person were to talk to a Samaritan at this time, they would generally not even be in the same space because they are considered, the Samaritans are considered unclean. But Jesus starts this very basic conversation about water, and it moves to ethics. And eventually, we have this. The time will come when people will not worship the Father either on this mountain or in Jerusalem. 
me from Adam and from under the garden of Eden. But we Jews know whom we worship because it is from the Jews that salvation comes. Jesus has this amazing conversation, and he answers her ethical question, and then she opens it up to a religious conversation because she finally feels comfortable with Jesus. And I've had this conversation before. People are, I'm talking to somebody, and we, we're talking about a shared experience. Then pretty soon they're talking to me about, well, what, what do you do? I say, oh, what's your job? And they say, oh, I'm a whatever. And they say, well, what do you do? I'm a pastor. And they'll say, really? Uh, why are you here? It's, I'm at, maybe I'm at a bar playing pool or something. Why are you here? You're a Christian. Why are you here? Why are you in this place talking to me? It's the exact same kind of conversation Jesus is having with the Samaritan. And then I break that mold and I say, I'm a pastor and a Christian, but I'm trying to reach people. And here we are having a conversation and other Christians would never meet you because they would never be here. And then all of a sudden they start asking me religious questions, which leads us to point number four, religious conversation. This is a stage where we introduce religious themes. We start to talk about religious things. We introduce people to a relationship with not just ourselves, but with our God. Because we are God's representative. And by this time you've built bridges and you've established rapport and you've genuinely asked real questions. You've engaged people in a conversation. This is where you start to water maybe a previous seed or you plant a seed of faith. Corinthians says here, now as you excel in everything, faith, speech, knowledge, and in, in all diligence and in your love for us, also excel in grace. Today is the day where we start to excel in our speech, in our conversation, by taking an intentional stance on how we speak to people. And it's funny is that doing something with grace is having enough humility to know you don't know. When it comes to politics, I just get so tired of people bickering over things they don't even really know everything about. And I'm the first one to admit, I don't know. I wasn't there. I have no idea. But here's the thing. This is what they call the, the Dunning-Kruger effect. People with a little bit of information oftentimes believe they're very smart. But in reality, they oftentimes, people who think they're very smart are actually the lowest in intelligence in that particular topic. It's the people who know a lot who generally will admit and will actually rank themselves lower in understanding because, let's say, how many of you guys have ever read the Bible? Okay? You've read the Bible. If you are being humble, and let's be honest, if you're, if you're being real, the more you read the Bible, the more you realize how much you don't know about the Bible. And the more you study, the more you go, oh my gosh, I have no clue what I'm even talking about. Who am I to say anything about God? I have no clue what I'm even saying. I read the Bible, and I see new things every time. I've read the book of Corinthians how many times, and I'm still learning. But what happens is, this is actually, a, this is actually the place of humility. This is a place of understanding that you don't know. We need to understand, you guys, that, that people need your story, but you need to come with humility. Understand, you don't know their life. You don't know why they're into drugs or alcohol or their politics or this politician's life or this person's thing. You don't know that. Don't pretend like you know. You weren't there. You have no understanding of it. That's not what we're here for. We're here to show people the love of Christ. And your story and their story need to mix. And let's say... You don't have something to connect with somebody on. Let's say you are not uh, the person you're talking to. For example, last night I was at Harbor Freight with my son, and the, one of the gentlemen there, I was talking to him about buying a trailer, and pretty soon we're talking about how he goes to N.A. And I ask him, what drug are, what, what's your drug of choice? What's your, what, what were you struggling with the most? And he says, meth and alcohol. I never struggled with meth. I did struggle with alcohol. So I can honestly say I understand where you're coming from with the alcohol. But then what I did was I immediately introduced him in name to somebody from the congregation I know who struggled with meth. And I said, this person in my congregation knows what you're going through. I'd love to have you come to church on Sunday and meet that person. Because we, I don't expect you to know everybody or be able to relate to everything. If you meet somebody with kids and don't have kids, how many of us have kids? Raise your hand. If you don't have kids and you meet somebody with kids, you have all of these people who have kids to introduce that person to. How many of you guys have grandkids? I don't. 
So when I meet somebody who tells me about their grandkids, I immediately refer them to someone in my church who can, who can engage with them in a conversation about what it feels like to have a grandkid. Because i got to admit, I don't know. Struggling marriages, debates, arguments, we have that here at the river. Drugs and alcohol. If you didn't struggle with drugs or alcohol, praise God, I'm so glad you didn't. Your pastor did. You could say, honestly, hey, I didn't struggle with that, but my pastor did. Marriages, doubts, struggles, pain, cancer, disease. Everybody in this place is a resource for us and you and I. That's why Psalm says, how good and pleasant is it when God's people live together in unity. Amen? There is somebody here who can relate to everybody else out there. But you have to get to know each other here to have those conversations. So we're running out of time, so I'm just going to skip ahead here. This is what we've been learning. Know your own story. This was a few weeks ago. Know your own story. Have goodwill towards other people. We talked about having goodwill towards other people is that certain, that, that baseline friendship. Just being open to a conversation and being open to their goodwill. Not wanting anything from them. Being real. I'm so tired, especially of Christians, pretending. There's no reason to pretend. Why pretend? You can't get better if you're pretending. This is a hospital full of sinners, amen? Why are you afraid of admitting the fact that you struggle? If you go to the hospital, are you ashamed? If you're like, you walk in and go, oh, I, I got my arm got cut off in a car accident. And you, but do you hide it and go, I don't know what the problem is? You're bleeding all over the place. Oh, I don't know why I, I'm here. I, uh. You tell them, holy cow, my arm's cut off. I need help. And here at the church, we have the exact same experience. If you are struggling in some way, admit it. Talk about it. Let people know. That's how you get help. Talk with people. Get to know your church family. And then finally, take every thought captive. This is a great Bible verse. We're told to take every thought captive. But that's for next week. That's what we'll be talking about next week. It's taking every thought captive in the name of Christ. So let's pray, and let's get ready for communion. So if the folks want to come up for communion. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your grace, your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for being able to tell jokes and have fun. We thank you, Lord, for the weather being warmer. There are so many things that we are so thankful for, Lord, but more importantly than anything, we are so thankful for your grace and your mercy. We pray, Father, that you would extend to us some of that grace. You would help us to pepper or salt our language with grace. Help us to not focus on anger and negativity, but to focus on your love and positivity. Help us to relate to people on a positive level, not on an angry level. And then help us, Lord, for all those people that we judge in the world, if it's drugs or alcohol or prostitution or if it's politics or it's religion if it's muslims or jews or buddhists or whatever or different denominations i pray god that you'd help us to see those people from their perspective to see those people from where they are so that we can better know how to answer their questions as you tell us in colossians and we just pray lord for a spirit of humility because lord we're the first people to admit we don't know everything, but you do. So use us if you can. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to serve you in this way. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to start communion. Communion is a ritual that we do in the Christian churches. It's an opportunity for us to participate in history. A lot of churches don't really understand, or at least at the very least don't celebrate what it is that communion means. And communion is an opportunity for every single one of you to relate back to Christians through the millennium, all the way back to Christ. When we share in communion together, we are sharing in communion with the church up the street. We're sharing in communion with the church down the street. We're sharing in communion with the churches in Canada and Mexico. 
we're sharing communion with our brothers and sisters in Christ who are hiding underground in North Korea, afraid for their lives and celebrating communion with homemade wine because they can't get a hold of the juice they need. And on top of all of that, communing with the saints who have long passed. If you grew up in the church or if you have family who are Christians, you're communing with them. Across the centuries, And if you don't know God today, today is the time to set your ego aside. Admit the fact that you are a sinner in need of God's grace. And take communion as a symbolic way to tell God, I am a sinner, I need a savior, and I accept your death in my place. The symbolism of communion is so powerful because it represents the blood and the body. Jesus' blood that was shed for us. His body that was broken for us. And you got to be in a place where you recognize the fact that you are the one who deserved the punishment that Jesus received. But it's because of what Christ did for us that on the, at the end of days whether it's Jesus returning or it's the end of your life, it's at the end of your days that you will commune with your God once again. And you will have full assurance that you will see those loved ones and those people and your church family again because God promises that after we are resurrected from the dead, we will live eternal life with one another, finally, securely, forever. No pain, no suffering, no tears, no struggles. Pure love and grace and mercy in the presence of our God. So let's just take a moment. You have two cups. One is the bread and one is the wine. I want you to hold them apart. I want you to look at the the juice right now, the wine, the symbolism there. It's red for a reason. It represents Christ's blood. A real man, Jesus Christ, lived, was crucified, crown of thorns put on his head, wrists and ankles pierced with nails. Look at the bread. Jesus, beaten, beard ripped out, struck down, never making a defense for himself because he knew he was dying for you. There's no defense. He didn't defend himself. He submitted himself humbly. And then even after having been killed, the soldier went around and broke people's legs, and Jesus was pierced for your sins and mine. But his body was broken. Tell me reading from Corinthians. He says, for I, for I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus knew his friend was going to betray him and he still loved him. Think about those people in your life right now who have betrayed you, who have hurt you, who have wronged you. And then know without a doubt that Jesus, on the day he knew he'd be crucified, still loved on Judas. And forgive that person right now. Give up the need for revenge. Give up the need to make sure they know how you feel. To get them back. Give that up right now. And give yourself wholeheartedly clean and pure to your God and Savior. And on that night when he, when he was betrayed, Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he said this, this is my body which is for you. Do this remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way after supper, he also took the cup. And remember, Jesus on the cross 
looking down at the people who had just crucified him. He didn't say, God, come down with angels and kill these people. He didn't mock them and tell them, oh, you don't know what you've done. You're going to suffer. You're going to die for this. He said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Again, the people that you argue with and fight with and get into arguments with online and all this other nonsense, if they don't know Christ, they don't know what they're doing. See them with Christ's eyes. Again, forgive them and try to understand life from their perspective. And Jesus did in that moment. He looked down and he knew these soldiers are following orders. These soldiers are blinded to spiritual things. These soldiers don't know what they're doing. And he asked and he begged God to forgive them. You don't know what's going on in a person's life. Admit that. This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So I want to just ask that, uh, is it Shauna's coming up? For a, Shauna, would you come up? We're having testimonies. I know we're going to go just a couple of minutes over. You know, just, just, be, just understand that uh, if it was the 1800s, you know how long church services were? Three hours. So if we get out of here at an hour and five minutes, amen. Hello, okay. everybody. All right. Well, we are excited for testimony number two. We have Shauna um, not only wants to expound a little bit on her story, but we want to give her an opportunity as one who is a uh, leader on the women's ministry team, along with Joyce, Bev, and Tuva, right? And Bev, right, I already said. Uh, and just to give also testimony into why women's ministry is important to the church um, and kind of inter interweave kind of your experience with, with women's ministry. Yeah, so I was asked to share a story. So we're going to take a little flashback, not too long of a flashback, back to when I was 21, just a couple of years ago. <laughs> and uh, so I was, uh, no. Uh, so I was 21, and I was a new Christian, and I was in college, and I was part of a Bible study uh, of with women, only women in there, and I really got to know them. I was... They suffered through all my uh, questions. Probably I was very baseline, not knowing much about Christianity and, and how to do it. So my whole worldview was flipped upside down, but even more new was the ring on my finger. After spring break, Joshua had proposed to me on the way back. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, we're so excited. We're making all these plans. And I share this with my Bible study leader. And she's like, great, I'm happy for you. And then... It just so happens that our both of our leases were up. So what are we going to do? This is like the first step towards our marriage. And so we, w we took and went around the city, and we found ourselves a cute little apartment, and we were going to move in and um, get ready for our marriage. And uh, so later that week, my Bible study leader is like, can, we, can you meet me for coffee later this week? I'd really like to talk to you and just hang out for a little while. Well, she didn't, she wanted to hang out, but she really was there to challenge me, and in a good way. She had laid the foundation, showed me how she cared for me through all these other interactions. So we had that foundational relationship where she would be able to challenge my thinking um, about this moving in together before we got married thing. And she said to me, her name was Beth. So Beth, if you happen to see this, I still remember you. Beth Moon. And she said, um, Shauna, I just... I just want you to consider any other alter alternative to this because she said, um, you're not that strong. You're not that strong in your walk that you think that if you really think that Josh is going to sleep on the couch and you're going to sleep in the bed, having already been there, done that, she's like, I don't think so. Like, and I was like, oh. I was like, what? We're, we can do this. We're strong. But the more we thought about it, and I went home and talked to with Joshua about it, and like, you know, we got to figure something out. We got to figure something out. Because 
we wanted our marriage to be based on Christ. And we were going against family who didn't know Christ. And, and they were like, yeah, just live together. Why do you even need to get married at all? I mean, I don't know who else's parents say that to them. But my, my mom said that to me. Why don't you just live together? Um, you know, kick the tires, see how it goes. You know, and it's like, I, I don't know. I feel like I already kicked those tires. And, and, and we're, so we wanted to start off with that good foundation, that healthy foundation, because um, it, it's not so much about what people would think about us, because I was always raised to think, like, oh, what are people going to think about us if we, if, we do, if we do this thing and they see us doing it? But it's not about what they think about us, but it's about how our lives reflect Christ. And we wanted to be different from the very beginning. And Beth's challenge to me changed the course of what we did. And we did not live together. Joshua lived in Madison. I lived in Eau Claire by myself in the apartment. It wasn't that hard to figure it out, but it took that challenge from a friend to make me grow and to make me think. But it was the time that we spent together that gave her that foundation to be able to challenge me. And I thank her for her boldness. Friends challenge each other. Iron sharpens iron. We get stronger by challenging each other and walking alongside each other. So spend the time and get to know the people in these pews. Make the relationships and dig deep because somebody might need you to challenge them in their walk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shauna, for coming up. I know a little while ago you shared a little bit of your story, but this is a different picture. So again, I want to emulate it, not emulate, emphasize it to you. Please talk to your neighbor. Don't I want to challenge you two to not leave right away as soon as service is over every Sunday. I want to challenge you to talk to at least somebody and to really just get to know them more uh, because that's how we are going to grow and that's how, we, that's how we are best as a church is to unify, not to separate ourselves and to only talk to people that we're comfortable talking to, even though I could say that. Um, so that's a challenge. So as we call Pastor Joshua and call up the worship team, um, we'll just get to pray one more time and then just close our service. Father, we just thank you for your blessings. We thank you for giving us this space to honor you. We thank you for allowing us to grow in relationship with one another. God, without the church, we are isolated. We, are, we stay broken, God, because you want us to be surrounded by other believers who will lift us up, who will encourage us, who will... Who will um, associate uh, and, 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 and know what we're going through, just as Josh had said. And we are just so thankful of how you're working in this church, Lord Jesus. And we just want to walk with you. We want to be with you. We want to know you. We want to see how you're working in other people's lives, Lord. We love you, Lord Jesus. So we lift up this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.